This is Talk of the Nation. I'm Neil Cummin in Washington. It's now more than 10 years since the Boston Globe first broke the news that the archdiocese there covered up for priests who sexually abused children. Just this week, similar reports erupted in Los Angeles after lawyers for the church lost a long battle to keep tens of thousands of damning documents secret. The long series of scandals has contributed to another problem for the Catholic Church, a shortage of priests. According to one survey, the number of priests in the United States has declined from 58,000 in 1965 to 39,000 in 2011. And amid this crisis, who might decide to enter the priesthood and why? If you've considered becoming a priest, call and tell us what you decided to do. Our phone number is 800-989-8255. Email talk at npr.org. You can also join the conversation on our website. That's at npr.org. Click on Talk of the Nation. Later in the program, a newcomer shakes up Israeli politics. But first, who's becoming a priest? Jeff Kirby is a Catholic priest and vicar of vocations for the Diocese of Charleston, where he advises those interested in joining the priesthood. He joins us now by smartphone from his office in Charleston. Nice to have you with us today. Thank you, Dan. It's good to be here. And you were in seminary when uh, news broke about uh, the, the scandal there in Boston. I wonder, uh, did it give you a moment's pause? Oh, my goodness. I think uh, any person of goodwill was definitely surprised by uh, the scandal, the, of course, the abuse of minors by priests, and then, of course, the uh, lack of response by, by leadership. So, I, But I think that through it all, there really is a, a discernment of you know, what is the actions of individual people and what is the priesthood? And so for myself, while I was in the seminary, that distinction was very important. You know, I said, well, these are uh, men who have committed uh, horrible acts, but this is not the priesthood. Uh, so in, in the end, uh, I, after some consideration, you decided to continue? I did. I did. I was ordained in 2007 a priest, and as you were mentioning, uh, currently serve as the vicar of vocation. So it's kind of like a recruiter to help uh, other men think about the priesthood. We want to hear from uh, those who've made that consideration in our audience and about the decisions they made. 800-989-8255. Email talk at npr.org. And on the, John is on the line with us from Chicago. And John's left us. Uh, uh, we'll try to get some other callers up as soon as we get some calls in. Uh, in the meantime, if we go back uh, to uh, uh, Father Jeff Kirby, uh, as you talk to people uh, these days, uh, how much does this series of scandals, I guess we have to call it, how much does that enter their thinking? Well, I think it's definitely a reality on most people's minds and, and just in general and, and the general population, but also you know within the Catholic Church and and certainly in the hearts of young men who are thinking about priestly service and, and the church. So, so it's a reality that, has, that hasn't and should affect the way that we think and, and approach the priesthood. Is it simply the, uh, the question of uh, how could their fellow priests or their future fellow priests do such a thing? How could the church protect them? But also uh, how they might come to be regarded uh, by, uh, I guess you'll excuse the expression, civilians. Absolutely. Absolutely. Myself, I, I thought that myself sitting in the seminary, and I thought, gosh, do, do I make all these sacrifices and, and know that there is a possible veil of suspicion in regards to myself or, you know, my desire to help people, serve people? And so I think that that is real. And oftentimes it's realizing, well, I know who I am. I know why I desire to serve. And I think the majority of people who know their local priest or local pastor, they begin to understand what the priesthood truly is. And is, again, this is a, a crisis. Is it special to be of service in a crisis? In particular, and in fact, as our national numbers have, have seen a decline what we are seeing right now as far as entrance to the priesthood, our numbers are actually going up. In fact, some of our highest numbers were right after the scandal in Boston. And I suspect that part of that was, you know, some young men in the, in the church uh, who are thinking, do I, do I make this leave? Do I, do I say yes to this, this possible call to the priesthood? And I think as they see bad examples and they see the way that some people view the priesthood, that kind of inspires them to say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to take the leap. I, I, I know what the priesthood really is. I know what I want to do. 
and I know the challenge right now that, that really the entire church has to regain an aspect of trust. Let's get another caller in on the conversation. This is Chris. Chris on the line with us from New York. Hi, how are you doing? Good, thanks. Okay, um, I just wanted to comment about the, um, you know, the involvement um, with, with everything that was going on. I was actually, I've been a youth mentor for uh, quite some time. And, um, you know, I had uh, a couple of uh, times in my life where I was, you know, considering becoming a priest, um, you know, getting into the church a little more. And um, at the time, this is going back about 15, 20 years ago, um, one of my colleagues, he, um, it came to light that he was actually an ex-priest. And um, that was something that was very new. I had no idea that he, uh, you know, was a priest at any time. And he had uh, kind of hinted towards, um, like, in some, some internal things that were going on within the Catholic Church that were, uh, you know, being swept under the table. And um, this was before a lot of the scandals were even brought to light. So uh, that kind of influenced me to uh, dig a little deeper into uh, what was going on. And then a couple of years, you know, into uh, knowing this, it actually started coming out that there was all these sexual allegations regarding priests. And was that uh, the only factor that made you reconsider? Um, you know, I, I, it, was, it was just something that was, was close to my heart. Um, I had a, uh, you know, a lot of factors. I, I prayed upon it a lot and just, you know, really questioned what was going on. And, uh, you know. And are, st are you still close to the church? Um, fortunately not. Um, you know, I've, I've kind of lost my faith in a way. Um, you know, I'm not really comfortable with the fact that, uh, you know, these people who are really put in charge of, of, of many different things and, and are very close to the community could have had this, uh, you know, inner demon that nobody knew about. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't want to be a part of that. Chris, thanks very much for the call. Thank you. Joining us now is James Martin, a Jesuit priest, editor-at-large for America Magazine, also author of The Jesuit Guide to Almost Everything, A Spirituality for Real Life. He joins us now from studios at Carnegie Hall in New York City. Good of you to be with us today. My pleasure. And I, I wanted to ask you uh, about that last caller. Uh, there have been uh, a lot of people who question their faith, and, of course, a lot of uh, men who question their uh, whether they should uh, go into the priesthood as, as a result of the scandal. Yeah, it's not surprising. Um, I think that uh, if a person doesn't think seriously about this particular issue about the sex abuse crisis before they enter the seminary or religious life, they're you know they need to have their head examined. I mean, because it's uh, you know, I mean, I'd be surprised that if someone didn't know about it, and I also be would be surprised if they didn't consider it carefully. But uh, in my experience, it it may slow things down. It may keep some people away. But I, I always compare it to something like divorce. I mean, you still have people getting married. Uh, even though the divorce rate is something like 50 percent, even knowing that people come into a, you know, uh, into that life, knowing that there there might be problems. So um, for most guys, it, it might slow them down. But excuse me, it might slow them down a little bit. But for most guys, they'll they'll still enter. So it's it should be on their mind. But often it doesn't stop them, you know, uh, you know, dead in their tracks. And as you talk to people in and outside of the church has, you know, there's the there's the local priest, as uh, Jeff Kirby was mentioning. Uh, there's also the institution of the church. Or, do people view those things separately? It depends on the person. Uh, normally, you know, the people that I spoke with and, you know, we work, worked on this issue at America Magazine, uh, they'll say that they might be suspicious of the local bishop or the hierarchy, so-called, uh, or the institutional church, but they love, you know, their local pastor. They love Father so-and-so. Uh, that's, that's kind of the norm. On the other hand, you know, you meet people who are in parishes where the pastor has been removed, you know, and so it's even exacerbated. I mean, they, they feel betrayed, uh, you know, almost on a personal basis. Uh, that That's much more difficult for people. So it's it's really been a, uh, it's been a real crucifixion for the church, mostly, you know, for the victims above all. But I think there's no Catholic that hasn't felt the, uh, the sting of this. And then you see the uh, reports again this week from Los Angeles, and here we go again. Yeah, uh, here we go again. On the other hand, a lot of these, this is not to minimize it in any way. Um, I see it as, you know, a continuation of the same scandal because these are, you know, older cases that are coming up. It's still demoralizing. Uh, but I think it also needs to be said that the church has put in uh, incredible amounts of time to making sure this doesn't happen again. Funny enough, just today I received in the mail 
uh, yet another background check. We have to have background checks every three years. And so the church has made a lot of steps in the right direction. But it's not a, it's not a scandal and it's not a problem that, that's over by any means. Uh, Jeff Kirby, uh, some of those uh, uh, changes in terms of uh, background checks and, and in training for seminarians now. Oh, absolutely. We definitely, the when a man, first of all, just as general discernment in regards to, a, you know, within a community of faith or Catholic university. And then when he begins the, the actual application process, which can spend several months, it involves all kinds of aspects of, first of all, an autobiography. It's, it's always very interesting to see how a person describes himself. And then, of course, there are all kinds of letters are recommendation from teachers and coaches and and if the man was involved in in any type of ministry with vulnerable persons so children or, or older folks uh, then we we want to hear from people who are involved in that and then of course there's a psychological evaluation which is a an extensive series of batteries that include all kinds of tests for uh, leaving behavior narcissism and all kinds of things that even 10 years ago we may not have done or done as extensively that we are definitely doing now. As I sometimes tell people with the applications, we're looking for three H's, uh, healthy, happy, and someone who is desiring to be holy. We're talking with two Catholic priests today, uh, Jeff Kirby, who you just heard, also uh, Jim Martin, about uh, who wants to become a priest these days amid the scandals that afflict the Catholic Church. If you've considered becoming a Catholic priest, call. Tell us what happened. Did you decide to join? 800-989-8255. Email us, talk at npr.org. Stay with us. I'm Neil Conan. It's the Talk of the Nation from NPR News. This is Talk of the Nation from NPR News. I'm Neil Conan. In November of last year, Boston Magazine ran a long piece called Resurrection, which posed a question, what kind of man wants to become a priest? The author of that article, Patrick Doyle, joins us shortly. He profiled Eric Caden, now Father Eric Caden, who entered St. John's Seminary in the fall of 2004, just a couple of years after the Boston Globe broke news of the abuse scandal that in that city's archdiocese. Caden grew up Catholic. As a child thought becoming a priest might be a good idea, he returned to that idea as a college student, experimented with celibacy, and began meeting with other men considering the seminary. He enrolled, and after a detour through medical school, then back to St. John's, graduated and became a priest. So call, tell us if you've considered becoming a priest, what did you decide to do? 800-989-8255. Email talk at npr.org. You can also join the conversation on our website. That's at npr.org. Click on Talk of the Nation. Jeff Kirby, Catholic priest and vicar of vocations for the Diocese of Charleston, and Jim Martin, Jesuit priest and editor-at-large for America Magazine, are our guests. And let's get another caller in. This is David. David on the line with us from Columbia, Tennessee. Yeah, thank you for taking my phone call there. Go ahead, please. Okay, uh, I just wanted to, to make a comment that uh, it's not the priesthood itself or the religion or any of that that uh, causes these bad things to happen. It's the individuals and, you know, their uh, temptation that, that affects these individuals. With so many bad things in the world, uh, the explosion and homosexuality, abortion, we need more priests out there to stand firm in their beliefs and, you know, to fight off that temptation. And the temptation to the other people, you know, they're, they're the closest thing to God that we've got. They're, they're a conduit to, to holiness, and we need them. I, 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 of, I hear what you're saying, David, but it was not just uh, those who committed these terrible crimes. It was the systematic cover-up of those crimes. Well, I understand that, but if you, if you, if you try to get rid of everybody that's coming, I understand it was wrong to do that, but the, the depths at which it goes could destroy the priesthood itself if it goes too far. And I mean, there may, there may need, need, need to be a shakeup, uh, some kind of realignment, you know, to get good priests back, you know, to separate the good priests from the ones who are being, you know, tempted. There may need to be some kind of oversight, you know, something like that, where people go in and, and uh, confront each other on a regular basis or something like that. And are you considering the priesthood? 
Yeah, I've considered it for a long time now. Uh, I'm actually still considering it. And, you know, the only two things that are really stopping me are uh, I have a very short temperament. And I can't help that. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, just uh, there's several other procedural things that I just I haven't been able to apply myself to. But that's, that's mainly the, the, the gist of it right there. All right, David. Thanks very much for the call. Good luck with that temper. Thank you, sir. And uh, he mentioned uh, some of the efforts uh, to clean up the uh, uh, the problems as they happened. That has happened nowhere more than in Boston, where this story broke. Patrick Doyle is the executive editor for Boston Magazine. He wrote that piece we mentioned called Resurrection in the November 2012 issue of Boston Magazine. That's a piece that inspired the conversation we're having now. Patrick Doyle joins us now from his office there in Boston. Nice to have you with us today. Good afternoon. And you say that in large part, uh, the Archdiocese of Boston turned this around by essentially hiring a turnaround artist. They did. They did. Um, you know, Archbishop now, you know, Cardinal O'Malley has a... Uh, had great success in uh, turning around the archdiocese, and he, you know, I did it twice before, uh, most uh, recently locally in Fall River, Massachusetts. And in part by as soon as he took over uh, from the disgraced predecessor, uh, he tried to make a settlement with the victims as soon as possible. Absolutely, within a, within a few weeks, um, he took, I think, the very smart step of talking with uh, the victims of the crimes and. Uh, immediately offering a settlement, um, dropping any arguments that uh, you know the church wasn't wrong, and looking to move beyond and uh, you know kind of create a new chapter. I think in the Boston Archdiocese, and also sold off a lot of church property uh, to pay the settlement fees. Hundreds of millions of dollars in property. Yep, um, most 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 of went to uh, to Boston College, who uh, is expanding their campus quickly. And uh, most of the area right around the seminary among the property sold. Indeed, it was. Uh, they used to call it Little Rome in Boston. Um, these beautiful um, old buildings uh, that the seminary owned and the church ran out of, and the uh, by, by selling them, um, the seminary is kind of uh, this one remaining outpost um, over there in Newton. And you describe it uh, as the scandal broke as uh, a nearly deserted, quiet place, and uh, that's changed. Absolutely. And, you know, around 2002, when the scandal broke, um, I think there was about 60 students or so at the seminary, down from a peak of about 400 at mid-century. Um, and, you know, by 2004, it was down to 30. And since then, since, uh, you know, Cardinal O'Malley has made his changes, um, you know, currently I believe there's 100, 120 students over at the seminary. It's the highest in 20 or 30 years. And we were talking earlier with uh, Jim Martin, who said, uh, in a way, this is a scandal that is, uh, in the past, these are, for the most part, older allegations that are just coming to light, in part in Los Angeles, because lawyers for the church uh, resisted the publication of these documents for so long. But in any case, there in Boston, what is the rate of new allegations, and how does it compare with the past? Um, the new allegations uh, are, are pretty low. The vast majority occurred before 1990. Um, and a lot of the changes they've made in the training and selection of seminarians and then actually the training of students and uh, church staff, I think, has really cut down um, you know, on these uh, terrible crimes. Is it fair to say uh, the archdiocese there in Boston has gone a ways in recovering the trust of its uh, uh, of church members, uh, of, of uh, the parents, and indeed of the victims? I, I think that it's going to be a, a long road still uh, to travel. You know, back in the 1960s, around 76% of Catholics were going to Mass weekly. Um, in Boston now, I believe it's about 16% of area Catholics are going to Mass. So there's a lot that uh, they can really improve, and they've, they've got a new marketing campaign. Uh, I'm not sure how successful it's been, um, but they really are trying to bring people back to the church. Well, thanks, uh, and it was a, a really interesting piece, and, and we thank you for prompting our conversation. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, Patrick Doyle, executive editor for Boston Magazine, with us from his office in Boston. You can find a link to his piece on our website. Just go to npr.org, click on Talk of the Nation. Our guests are Jeff Kirby, Vicar of Vocations for the Diocese of Charleston, with us by smartphone from his office there, and Jim Martin, editor-at-large for America Magazine, author of the Jesuit Guide to Almost Everything, uh, with us from Carnegie Hall Studios in New York. And, and I wanted to ask you, Jim Martin, uh, uh, we were talking about the Archdiocese of Boston there. How much does it matter, Archdiocese to Archdiocese, uh, location to location, how the church has responded to this, uh, this crisis? 
Well, I think you have different bishops who initially took it, uh, you know, more seriously than than others. Um, I think there was a little bit of resistance at the beginning, but, you know, frankly, there are nationwide uh, standards now that everyone has to follow that come from the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops that has a, an entire office of what's called child and youth protection. So I, I, I think maybe there are some bishops who, who might be more um, uh, sort of open to, say, meeting with victims, those kinds of things, maybe more, you know, proactive. But, you know, there's a kind of baseline that you can't go beneath uh, in terms of, as the, as the writer was saying, Mr. Doyle, uh, you know, some of the, the new um, standards that are, that are being set forth by the church. So, you know, and thank God. Um, I mean, because, you know, if we hadn't, you know, taken a look at this and hadn't sort of faced this squarely, I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's a very, it's, it's the only Christian response, basically. But to answer your question, I think there's a, there's a baseline, you know, below which uh, no bishop or archbishop can go. And is one of those national standards that allegations of molestation are treated as uh, criminal charges? Oh, absolutely. Any credible allegation means that the uh, priest, uh, you know, or brother or sister, you know, whoever it might be in the church, or uh, as... Um, uh, Father Kirby was saying a lay worker in the church is removed, you know, from ministry, you know, until there's an investigation. So it's really strict. I mean, it's very draconian. Uh, and, you know, but I should also point out that other, you know, institutions are also struggling with this as well. You know, you look at something like Penn State or the BBC. So I think it's a it's an issue that, you know, all institutions are struggling to uh, grapple with. And the, the Catholic Church is trying to take the lead on it. Here's an email from Father Jim in Kentucky. Personally, I was raised Roman Catholic and felt called to the priesthood during elementary school while in Catholic high school. I had some questions and problems with a variety of Catholic dogma and practice, felt drawn to the Episcopal Church after my father joined that church in our neighborhood. Through all of that, my mentor priests in the Roman Catholic Church were wonderful role models and counselors. Before he died last year, my oldest brother revealed to the family that he'd been abused by the parish priests at our home church. While this is indeed a horrid revelation, it doesn't do much to smear my memories of the wonderful priests I grew up with. My identity as an Episcopal priest, I find, has always been grounded and formed by my Catholic roots. Uh, let's go next to uh, Satish. Satish is on the line with us from Dayton. Yeah, uh, I came to this country in 2000, and uh, I'm, I'm originally from India. I, I, I came ordained as a priest for five years, and that is when, um, first of all, the September 11th attack happened, and I would travel about the country with my caller, uh, and I felt safe, and then the child abuse uh, 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 scandal hit, and uh, going on an airplane wearing a collar then became problematic. I would get stares. In any case, the reason that I called was because uh, the child abuse crisis was one of the reasons why I stayed back in the United States. I saw the challenge that was going to come. I had a great ministry here at Immaculate Conception Parish in Dayton, Ohio, and uh, I was very close to the children, and I heard p uh, priests um, stopping interacting with kids or going to the schools uh, to visit with the kids, and I took a different approach. I said, I'm going to do everything right, uh, and I stayed back in this country, and I still have a very vibrant ministry in the parish with children and with young people. But the reason, one of the reasons that I stayed back after my master's and my PhD at the University of Dayton was to, to in some way, personally um, um, uh, address the challenges that emerged from the crisis. I want to be a better priest. I wanted to do things better than uh, we have done in the past. And it has paid off. I have a fabulous relationship with, with, with the parishioners and the kids at school and our youth ministry here in the parish. And uh, in some way, I think the crisis brought the better, at least in me. And I know that now we have nationwide standards for, uh, for all, and we are implementing all these meticulously. I think the church is a much safer place. And if we can, as priests, commit ourselves to our kids and our young people, I think that itself will be a great uh, favor to the church. Satish, thanks very much for the call. We appreciate it. Thank you. And Jeff Kirby, I wanted to turn to you. Um, are the young men you're finding, or the men you're finding, are they, they're not all young, I suspect, uh, the men finding that are interested in the priesthood, are they coming from different places than they used to? Oh, definitely. We are seeing a, a unique um, contribution in regards to vocational interest to the priesthood. Uh, two in particular that always seem to stand out and are of interest to people. First, in regards to the amount of converts to the Catholic faith who are now expressing um, and, and just an amazing interest in, in the priesthood. So a lot of times when someone converts, we ask about three to five years that they would live as a Catholic before 
we really start to talk about the priesthood just to make sure any newness wears off and all. But we see, even after those three to five years, uh, an intense interest in the priesthood among converts to the Catholic Church that, that we just haven't seen in the past. And then secondly, in regards to first-generation Hispanic uh, young men who are bilingual, which is a tremendous gift, especially in the Southeast, but also just come with a, a passion and a real desire for service, many of them having grown up maybe with parents who did not have legal status or seeing the community of migrant workers, you know, domestic violence, drug abuse, and various things, and say, you know, I, I want to make a difference. I, I, I want to be a part to, to make this better. So while we still have our general interest among um, middle class uh, young men who are Anglo-Saxon and, and so on, we are seeing an incredible interest by converts and then this first generation uh, among Hispanics. Uh, Jeff Kirby is a vicar of vocations for the Diocese of Charleston. Also with us, uh, Jim Martin, a Jesuit priest and editor at large for America Magazine. You're listening to Talk of the Nation from NPR News. Nathan's with us from Pensacola. Hey, how are you guys doing today? Good, thanks. Yeah, I'm a priest in the Eastern Orthodox Church, and as such, you know, we wear similar garb, and uh, I was out, you know, one day with my children, and uh, one day someone made some very upsetting remarks about me being with children, and I had a long conversation with a friend of mine about, you know, should I go out wearing my clericals? Should I be seen as a priest? You know, what effect will that end up having on, you know, my reputation, on, you know, on my children, and so on and so forth? And a very interesting thing happened shortly after that. I was walking downtown, and I was in my clericals, and, and a man came running up to me and just fell down in front of me and started weeping. And he was heading to the bay to go kill himself because his son had died in the war. And he just saw me and just started weeping and confessed to me what he was going to do, and, and I was able to take him to the hospital. And I realized if I had allowed my fear to dictate my actions, then that man might not be here today. And so the role of the priesthood in the community is so important, and it shouldn't be overshadowed uh, by this atrocity. And it is an atrocity, and one that I've spoken out uh, against and many priests have spoken out against. But, you know, we don't look at police officers uh, in light of just, you know, police brutality, and we don't look in, at, at teachers as all being, you know, uh, slapping you on the hand with the ruler, even though, of course, those things have happened, and that's why that stereotype exists. But we need to also look at the importance of what the priesthood brings to a community, that they feed the poor, that they take care of the sick, that they visit the elderly and infirmed, and, and that gets lost, I think, in, in the shadow of this. I wanted to read this email, uh, uh, interesting, from the Rev. Carl. I'd like to point out that the scandals of the Catholic Church have reached beyond their priesthood. I'm a universalist minister. Even I face judgment from people who opine that only pedophilia would drive someone to be a man of faith. This has become an issue to the whole religious community, and our differing faiths need to work together to fix these wounds. Uh, Nathan, uh, thank you for that story. It's quite a story. Thank you. And I uh, wanted to read this email from uh, Mark in Duluth. I'm seriously considering become a Je becoming a Jesuit priest. I'm drawn to the priesthood and specifically the Jesuits because of the work they're doing amongst the poor in education and missions around the world. I'm currently beginning spiritual direction and looking forward to entering the novitiate in the fall of 2015. Uh, uh, Jim Martin, if he does that, what, it's going to be five or six years before he can expect to become uh, ordained? Uh, longer than that. <laughs> he... Um... He'll enter the Jesuit novitiate and become a Jesuit the day he enters, but uh, uh, it takes Jesuits about uh, 10 or 11 years before they're ordained. But uh, we're happy to have good men. And <laughs> that's a long process. It is a long process. Yeah, I, I uh, joked with a friend of mine. I said I could be a brain surgeon in less time, and he was a physician, actually a Jesuit physician, and he closed his eyes and thought, and he said, yeah, you're right. You could be a brain surgeon in less time. <laughs> <laughs> well, th thank you very much for your time, and we're uh, sorry you squandered all that time to become a journalist. <laughs> Exactly. James Martin, a Jesuit priest, editor-at-large for America Magazine and National Catholic Weekly, joined us from studios at Carnegie Hall in New York City. Our thanks as well to Jeff Kirby, also a Catholic priest, a vicar of vocations for the Diocese of Charleston. Eh, he spent a long time studying for that, too. Thank you very much for your time today. My pleasure. After a short break, we'll get an update on the surprising results in yesterday's elections in Israel. Stay with us for that. I'm Neil Conan. It's the Talk of the Nation from NPR News.